in this day and age is beyond comprehension. I feel, mm -hmm. without being too judgmental, that practicing 19th century medicine in the 21st century. Exactly. That it it has to change because uh, the other you know the the other thing that I think also is important is all the contaminants that are in our food. Mm -hmm. Now, um, and all of those you know the the glyphosate you know the the GMOs you know you know going back to my my my, my dear daughter uh, one of the things that she said to me back when we were, uh, when I was still living in the bush on a lake in Ontario when she would get my a friend of mine would call her the the you know the the kitchen police she would, you know pull things out of the cupboard and she would say can you pronounce that if you can't pronounce that why would you put it in your mouth exactly <laughs> you know, and into the garbage hi everyone and welcome to the eat real to heal podcast i am your host nicolette richet and founder of the green mustache restaurants a collection of plant-based whole food unrefined 100 percent organic restaurants that only serve the best of the best food nutritious but highly delicious as well. So go check out one of our cafes if you are in British Columbia, knowing that 10 more will be coming to New York City post COVID once the borders open, which we're so excited about. And I'm also the founder of the Richer Health Companies, where we have a wellness center in beautiful Pemberton, British Columbia, where you can come for private retreats and group retreats where you get to get hands on get in there, get pampered, but also learn the art and science of using food as medicine to reverse our chronic disease. Now, on today's show, we have a very beautiful, wise woman, Judith Hoylett from Pemberton, British Columbia, originally a transplant from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, so from the East Coast, but she made her way out here where she now lives on a beautiful piece of property in Pemberton, connected to the land, and she has got some stories and wisdom for you today. Now, we had her daughter, Sarinda, on our show last week and Sarinda is incredible. She is also a marvelous woman with tons of experience in plant-based whole food eating, raw vegan lifestyles, yoga, spirit medicine, health and wellness and everything in general. And we talk about we talked to Sarinda in that podcast and I love that afterwards when she was describing her mom Judith, she said, Judith is a scrappy woman who is ahead of her time. She's gone through the trenches to get to the places where she is now. And it's that wisdom that comes from having gone through her own traumas, gone through the trenches that she's going to be sharing with you on our show today. Now, Sarinda also described Judith as a fighter for the people and that she is. She did years of sexual assault and trauma work in, in downtown Toronto, and she has over 30 years of experience as a holistic psychotherapist where she's provided counseling to individuals and couples who have struggled with childhood trauma, addictions, relationship issues, depression, and anxiety. So if you're someone who has had any any, any, any of those traumas, um, please reach out to Judith and she can be of incredible support. What I love about Judith is that she's evolved her business, evolved her career and her knowledge, and now she specializes in what is known as spirit medicine integration counseling. What that means is, you know, right now you might have heard that there's a lot of people who are dabbling with or engaged in very deeply in plant medicine uh, work. And when you go through this work, I haven't done it myself, but I've heard the stories. Also, you can hear the stories of other clients of mine who have gone down this road of plant medicine. And when you go through this world work, it is life changing you see visions, your traumas unravel before your eyes, and you just get closer to your truth. And that's what Judith does with her clients who have gone down this path. Because often, once you've done the plant medicine work or are doing it, after you've done the work, 
and had a session, you're often just thrown back into society. Meanwhile, you're a brand new person with new visions, with new dreams, with new ideas, um, with new understandings. But to go back into, into society, you don't go back in as an old you, you go back in as a new you. So you're looking through different, a different lens, a different world of view. Some people have fundamental paradigm shifts when they use plant medicines. So what Judith has done is she has a practice where she helps people to integrate back into life with this newfound knowledge and awareness. And she's all about integrating the energy of the body, the mind, the spirit all together so that you can be whole and complete after and while you are doing this spirit medicine work. So that's what she does. Check out her website. The links will be in the show notes below. And integrating this process of images and memories and feelings that emerge throughout the ceremonies is so important so that we do have complete whole people walking around in our communities, in our societies, after they have gone through these ceremonies. And what I love is she's all about bringing you back to your true beingness. And who wouldn't want that? Before doing all of this work, Judith was a registered nurse. She has a BA in modern languages and a master's degree in adult education and counseling psychology. So she comes with a wellness wealth of knowledge. Now, what I also love about this woman and why we brought her onto this show as well is because she has successfully reversed her type 2 diabetes as well as a host of other health issues by turning to food as medicine and discovering one key trick that can help you reclaim your life. So we'll be discussing that in this podcast as well. So make sure you stay through to the end. And so we'll see you at the end, everyone. Enjoy the show and thanks for being with us. Welcome everyone to the Eat Real to Heal podcast. I am Nicolette Richet. And on today's show, we have the wonderful, beautiful Judith Hoylett coming to chat with us from beautiful Pemberton, British Columbia. Welcome, Judith. Thank you. Good to be here, Nicolette. So... It's last week I got to interview your daughter and you two are a dynamic duo and probably a lot of the kudos goes to you because you are her mother and you did raise her. Um, and, you know, Sorinda has this incredible life and just experience extreme diversity with all the different areas of health and wellness um, that she works in and the teachings that she's able to provide her students and the people who come to her. But so do you. And just for listeners out there, I've known Judith for, I mean, probably, I don't know, for, I think it's going on 15 years or something that I've been up in this area, but I'm only now just getting the opportunity to... Um, uh, connect with Judith on a much deeper level and to be able to bring all the beautiful gifts that she has learned to you. So Judith, we're going to be talking about, um, we're going to be talking about the fact that you healed yourself. And I really want to start with the diabetes. We bumped into each other at the farmer's market a couple of weeks ago. And you started telling me all about how you used food as medicine to help your help you get off your medication. So, do you want to take us back to when you start first started having health issues? Oh, that goes back a long ways. Um, it the first symptoms that my body was reacting to to what was going on in probably my mind, was back when I was in my mid-40s. And um, I was having a general checkup with my GP one day, took my blood pressure and said, I'm putting you on antihypertensive medication. And I was only in my mid-40s at that time. And were you going through, you know, a stressful time? Was your diet poor? Like, what were the contributing factors, do you think, to that? At that point in time, it was, it was cumulative, cumulative old stress, but I what had just begun work um, at, as the director of the Durham Region Sexual Assault Care Center. And so the subject matter, the, the issues that were 
current in my, my client population were stirring up old memories for myself. And I think those two factors came together. I was not aware of the, the interrelationship at that point in time. That unraveled later. But it was my mid-40s when I went for the first time on an antihypertensive medication. And so you did go on the medication because that's what you, that's what you knew, I suppose. That is what I knew. Yeah. And did you have at that time, you know, I mean, you have so much knowledge now about, you know, herbs and healing and food as medicine, but back then, was there any, no. nothing? No, not at all. I mean, I was a granola kind of, you know, bake your own bread kind of mom and, you know, believed in good nutrition, but the, the nuances, the, the, the facts of it, no, absolutely not. Right. And at that time, because I'm assuming you're in your 60s now, I would say. I'm a lot older than that, Nicolette. I'm 77. 77. Oh my gosh, you look amazing. Um, you're so vibrant. And if you have ever, any listeners out there, if you ever meet Judith, like you seriously will think she's in her 60s. She's so young and, and vibrant. Um, so Take us back then, because I know a lot of our listeners, we have, I mean, listeners as young as their, their teens all the way up into, you know, their 90s. Hopefully we have a few hundred year olds out there um, listening to this podcast. But, you know, times are a lot different now where we do understand that relationship between stress and the body. And I think we're just still starting to understand it. But what was it like back then? You know, the concept of thinking was, did you even... What was it then that you put two and two together about the no? Absolutely not. No, um, it was still symptom medication. I, I also was a nurse in you know in my earlier years. So I mean, I was trained in quote a medical model, mm -hmm. um, and you know worked within hospital settings with. Sick Kids Hospital, I worked at, you know, in, in NICUs and cardiac units. And so I was most accustomed to, you know, a symptom uh, pharmaceutical model. And do you think now, just from what you knew then and being in that world then and what you know now, do you find that our medical model has evolved? You know, if you were to go to the doctors now, would they still say, you know what, Judith, I think you need to you know, go on the meds or, or do you think it's evolved at all? Uh, no, I think it has evolved very little with exceptions, mm -hmm. with exceptions. Uh, and there are rare exceptions. Uh, usually medical doctors who have gone on to further studies in integrative medicine. Right. But I, I am still facing an ongoing, uh, you know, sort of eyeball role when I suggest certain things or ask certain questions when I go into the, uh, my, my local clinic. Right. So yeah. then what you went on the meds and then did that help? It well, worked to well, lower your blood pressure? It brought down my, my blood pressure. It really did nothing to do um, to bring down my, my stress levels. Um, after I, I was at the sexual assault care center for about five years. And at that point, I decided that um, for all kinds of different reasons, many different reasons, that I wanted to, to get out of the city, to get out of the, um, uh, the, 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 the stress of the city and get back to nature. And so one um, winter between Christmas and New Year's, I was up in the Muskoka area visiting a friend and we were out skiing out the back and I had my big Samoy dog and it was a beautiful sunny day with, you know, white snow and glistening and blue sky. And I turned to her and I said, I'm moving up here. Wow. And I went back to the city and put my house on the market and it sold within a week. And just all, like that. Just like that. And it's like, my God, I've just sold my whole life out from underneath me. And, and your kids were, were they grown up at this point? My kids were grown up at this point. Yes. Okay. So yes. you were able to just pick up and leave at the, you know, drop of a hat like that. Drop of a hat. A few minutes, you know, I think that was in, well, that was in, just the, in December, January. And uh, by May, 1st of May, I was 
sitting in a lovely little cabin right on a lake, listening to the loons coming in. Wow. And did you know that getting into nature more would be good for your health? Was that the drive? And That was a major drive. And um, I, I was very active politically on, you know, on uh, abuse against women in the city, very, very politically involved. Um, there had been some major cases that we were working with Metropolitan Toronto Police to change their policies and procedures, et cetera, et cetera. So my, I was involved in sort of really sort of high profile um, exposure. Mm -hmm. And um, at a certain point, it just, I said, enough, enough. And I had grown up in Northern Ontario. I'd grown up beside a lake and being able to put my skates on at the door and go cross the street and skate in the winter and swim in the summer. So I knew that, um, and, you know, for many years I had access to, a, you know, a cottage that was a family, um, family owned up in the Ottawa Valley. So I knew that's what fed me. Right. And it's, Interesting because when I lived in the city in Vancouver, when you're there, you're just in it and you're part of it. But it's not until you move out of the city and literally move, not just a vacation, but you move out of the city, you're in your new home for a few months and then you drive back to the city that you really understand how much is going on and how stressful it is, even just the noise pollution, the light pollution, the, you know, people pollution sometimes from moving like ants across the street. It, it, it's shocking. Exactly. Right and, <laughs> and it's incredible how, when you're in nature, I mean, I live in Pemberton as well. And you know, our town is what, 2300 or something. It's very small and we have expansive nature all around us and even to go into Whistler which is only a community of 12,000 I feel whoa it's overwhelming the cars are coming at me very fast and you and know the, there's the supermarket is too big yeah exactly but it's not until you get out of it that you realize and it's almost like your body takes a massive breath every time you come back yeah. to nature it's quite an it's quite an amazing thing so Tell me about what got you into doing this political work and especially around women's rights and sexual abuse and sexual assault. When I went back to do my master's degree, uh, it was at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. It was called OISE. And at that point in time, it was a radical bit of feminism and so our my profs my friends um we were all heavily into the whole issue of violence against women and um so when i when i graduated um a position opened up fairly close to my home actually and uh uh, during the interview, I mean, I just, I, I told the interviewer, this is my job. And she said, no, no, Judith, it has to go to a committee. I said, this is my job. <laughs> wow. And I did get it. And um, um, at that point, I, I didn't really have clear uh, either a clear assessment or clear memories of my own trauma. Mm. So during that time, um, yeah, during that time, it was triggered. And I think until I was able to get sufficient and good support, which I did, I had amazing su um, support amongst my peers and also amongst my th the therapeutic community that I was a part of. The, in Toronto, there's um, the Toronto Centre for Psychodrama. And it was, there were amazing facilitators within that group. And my primary therapist was in that group. So during that time, I was able to, you know, to surface and be able to um, hold in a different way um, elements of my life that I'd never quite understood. 
And it's interesting because, yeah, like, was this happening now in your 40s? Yes, yes, yes. in my mid-40s. And but- is it not true that a lot of women in their 40s, a lot of this can, you know, traumas um, that they have repressed and completely forgotten about can come and resurface? What I found, not across the board, but as you say, whether women would have a couple of children, the children would get into, into uh, school age activities, etc. And finally, a mom would have space in her life to begin to look at her own self. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, I found the same thing happened for me as well, because it was only last, I think it was last year, or the year before, I can't even remember now, but I had, I mean, literally gone through my whole life thinking like, I'm so lucky, knock on wood, I've never been raped, I've never been, um, mm. you know, had anything like that happen. And then all of a sudden, you know, three profound memories came up that, and I was so shocked. And it really was triggered from, one was a, my mom calling me and saying, hey, did you know about Mr. Duff? You know, he's dead now, but he has multiple cases of sexual assault, uh, be, uh, charges of sexual assault um, against him because all these students, you know, I lived right next to a school and, um, you know, my mom said, did anything happen? And all of a sudden it's like, boom, all these memories came. And it is, it's quite... Um, incredible. And then, uh, you know, and fortunately, I had gotten out of a situation with him before anything happened. But, you know, it made me so sad, because I thought, well, if I could have talked about that, then, and, you know, told my parents about that, potentially, he could have potentially not harmed a lot of other people. So then I had all this this guilt, survivor guilt, survivor guilt, all of that. But then all of a sudden, you know, that just kept unleashing more and more memories. And I remembered, I actually was raped. And it was, you know, I, it was, it was, um, it's weird because it's almost like you are somebody else. Yes. Right. Yes. You're two different people. And it's like, how can that happen to you? And it happened to you, but it's also, you look at it as though it was, it was somebody else. And then um, my brother's girlfriend gave me a really great book called man speak. I don't know if you've ever read mm-hmm. it. Yes. But the beginning of the book, I mean, it talks about the fact that um, one in five women and girls still get raped today. Yes. And brutally, and it's happening all around us. And it's happening still by the neighbors, still by the relatives. Um, Something like 97% of the cases or something like that. It's someone that you know. And I was reading this and then of course that brought up more memories. It's, It's quite amazing. So what do you recommend for women who are, you know, they've had their children, they have time for that introspection or there's their memories get triggered. What is one of the first things that they should do? And they start having memories? Yeah. Well, speak to someone who is safe. Um, Often, depending on the family, that might be the safe place or it might not be. Yeah. You want some place that you can begin to to explore because some the memories, they come in fragments. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, And they're often not clear. And you you might even be questioning yourself. So you need a safe environment where you can explore those feelings. Sometimes they're not even clear memories. They're just a body feeling, which can be very frustrating because somebody will know, I think something happened and I, I just can't, I just can't retrieve it. And it can drive them crazy. And but knowing that that is also a memory form and not to discount it. Yeah. Often families are too, too either guilt ridden or too much in denial to be able to hear. So I would strongly suggest that unless you know very well, you are going to get a good reception from your family to explore those issues elsewhere. Yeah, and probably with a professional as well. Somebody professional, yes. I mean, yeah. sometimes sometimes a really good friend can be helpful. But um, I remember a friend of mine saying 
to me when I was unloading a lot of stuff and it was all over everywhere. And, and she's still a close friend of mine today, <laughs> after all of these years, um, saying to me, Judith, I think you need more help than I am able to, su to supply you with. And I thought, oh my God, me having to see a therapist? But it was a, the, a greatest gift, the greatest gift. Oh, exactly. And I felt the same way as well that um, I didn't realize that, like you said, when you have that body feeling. And for me, it was, I have three girls and I started to just get very hyper. And before I even remembered, um, you know, and since birth, I was very hyper um, sensitive to, for example, them being with male strangers or them even being with male relatives or even, you know, I remember if my husband got up in the middle of the night, my husband, who's so kind and loving and caring, but I'd like, I'm like, what is he doing? And then I think like, that is crazy, Nikki, like he's going to the bathroom. But of course I'd have an immediate um, image of something bad happening to my girls. And I felt so guilty. And of course I didn't know how to tell him. I couldn't tell him, you know, that I, you know, potentially thought that there was something happening, but I mean, we would talk about it and, and I did start to feel a little bit crazy. Yes. Right. Because it's, you know, felt like it was coming from absolutely nowhere. And I thought, well, I'm just maybe a fear ridden mother here who thinks that my girls are going to get, you know, sexually abused by every man who comes their way. And, um, but then it was finally when it came out, it was good because going to a therapist was one of the best things I ever did. And just to be able to get it out there and then, you know, the tools that they were able, and they were such simple tools, actually, it doesn't take for, I mean, every case is going to be different, but the tools that this one particular woman gave me were just, they were so brilliant to allow me to process what happened. And I mean, it's probably going to be a lifetime of processing it, but at the same time, I do feel like it's not on my shoulders and on my back the way it, it was when, especially when I didn't even know what happened. Mm -hmm. And yes, and using, using tools, therapeutic tools, is, is tremendous because it gives you the ability to be able to have your feelings, but have them in a safe way, have them in a, in a kind of container that, um, uh, that are manageable so that you're not you know, flooded by them. Or as you say, think yourself crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, um, Especially, you know, when you're having body memories and you're not having clear images, that can even be, you know, more crazy making. Yeah, of course. Of course. And now that was really good advice that your friend gave you to just say, you know, hey, I think you need more help than what I can give you. And just to support you, that's, you know, probably one of the best things we can say to somebody if somebody comes forward to you and says, hey, you know what, um, I'm having these, you know, feelings or memories and um, yeah, such a good, a good gentle way of saying that. So then when you were in this work, I mean, you're going through your own um, transformative process plus you're working with women who've gone through their trauma plus you were doing your masters at the same time or were well, you I done? Finished my masters by that time and i finished my masters and then started the work but right yes, and so that was another uh, you know i was wondering you know in the sort of the mind crazy making was it the stories that i was hearing was you know um uh instigating kind of false memories within myself was were my memories true were they not true so it was it, it i i am forever grateful for the therapeutic you know community that i had because i i had immediate access to really really good both therapy and supervision mm -hmm. both things were true Right. And then when you were then out in nature, you know, sitting on the lake, um, did you find, did the stress shift entirely for you? Or what was that like? Did your blood pressure go yeah. down on its own? I worked at it, yes, because by that time, I had a few tools. Um, most of the work I was doing with the psychodrama is pretty insight-orientated therapy. And, but as time moved on, new tools were coming into the therapeutic field. For instance, mindfulness meditation. Mm -hmm. And that to me is for anybody who's doing any kind of psychotherapeutic work, 
is just a bedrock, you know, it's, it's a, a foundational block to acquire that, that, that kind of practice. And because it allows you to, to aid, to be able to go into your feelings, but also to like uh, techniques like breath work, that you can breathe through those emotions and you can be with them in a kind and supportive way and know that they will pass. Mm -hmm. So that was really important for, to get those, um, uh, like different kinds of tools that you can bring to traumatic memories. Yeah, exactly. And, and my, my, my blood pressure for a while did go down. It, uh, it returned I, for two or three years there. Uh, it did settle down a bit. Uh, but, you know, then like I tend to do is create more change and stress in my life so <laughs> so tell us about then what happened there because were you you were still doing this political work with the toronto police department as well um that had begun to fade out but i was still working with survivors mostly with survivors of of trauma mm -hmm. um, the years the the five years that i was living in muskoka and um uh at about the end of that five years, by then both my two children had moved out west and mm -hmm. they were in their sort of early, like 22, 23, 24, in that, in that age group. And, um, and Sarinda said to me at some point in time, Mother, why are you living in Ontario when you could be living in British Columbia? And I said, very good question, very good question. Um, some of the work that I was doing in, in that area had sort of come to more or less, I was looking for a change. I was looking for a change. And the, the quantity of trauma that I was listening to was also having its impact on me. And I knew that. So I decided that I would leave being a therapist and become a body worker. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> So at that point in time, I said, okay, I will come out West and I will do the rebalancing course that Sarinda had done. So that led me to uh, doing that in Costa Rica. Oh, wow. So talk, um, tell us about then what that is. What is rebalancing work? Well, rebalancing work is a combination of um, uh, joint release work and deep tissue work. And uh, it, uh, it's, 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 it's mm, I, I like it as a form of, of massage therapy. Um, when I came back though, I decided that, um, that that really was not for me, my preferred way of working. Right. But so wonderful to have gone and done the training. <laughs> oh, I bet. And also to have that work done on you as well. For six months. Yes. You know, it, it was, it was paradise. It was a, a wonderful, it was a really wonderful experience because it took me away for that six months uh, from everything that defined me. Mm -hmm. I had sort of sold another house out from underneath me. I was no longer, you know, Judith the therapist in a in a given community. Uh, I left my whole um, social network behind me. So it was a, a really good time for for inner, inter, you know, in, inner inspection and and also um, being really connected to to um, to nature to the jungle, to the howler monkeys, and especially to the ocean. The ocean taught me so much during that time. You know, I, I remember being out and, um, you know, snorkeling. And I would find that, you know, if I fought the crasher waves, that I would be submerged for longer and my snorkel would fill up. So to go with the ocean, just to go with it. Mm. Um, that was a teaching. 
And also I had some, you know, profound feelings of a deep, deep, deep connection with the universe in that ocean. I remember one day lying out there, you know, and feeling, wow, it is me and I am it. And it goes on forever. Mm, I love that. It was even at the time I really didn't quite understand it and it kind of revealed the teachings over time Mm -hmm. but it has been um uh, that kind of awakening has been sort of a a real uh touchstone for me ever since I actually have a painting that has a little black dot in it that was at the exact spot of the ocean where that that happened. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, and I love that you mentioned that because you reminded me actually of when I was in Northern Thailand mm. and I had taken a motorbike on this trail that took us out into the mountains and there was this beautiful Thai man who just really said, I just want you to come see my family. They would, you know, love to meet you. You'd love to meet them. We'll feed you and then I'll bring you back. And it was probably a very risky thing when I think like, as I say this out loud to do, but, you know, I went with this super kind, kind man and Um, we went into the woods and I remember there was one point where the motorbike couldn't go anymore and we had to walk and I was at this peak of a mountain and exactly how you described all of a sudden it was I felt so tiny and just like this little tiny speck in this immense universe and that what you said I am it and it is me and I remember having that exact same feeling and actually feeling profound bliss and calm and knowing that it's all okay. Like this is, we don't need to fight the universe. We don't need to um, work against it. We don't need, we just need to work in harmony and, and flow with it because it is me and I am it. And that was a huge moment for me in my life as well. Yes, it really, it really started me on, you know, the third you know, body, mind, and now spirit it really awakened that, uh, that feeling within me. Wow. And so six months, what I love about that story is the, well, first of all, all your stories is how you are able to just stop one thing and jump into something else. Mm-hmm. Like you don't have that fear or maybe you have the fear, but you don't let it stop you. And instead what you have is profound courage to be able to go do that. And I hope for people who are listening um, you know, that, you know, I grew up in a family that was quite fearful that, you know, they you, you, yeah, you don't do this. You don't become an entrepreneur. Why would you want to work for yourself? It's much better to get a paycheck and that stability. And shouldn't you buy a house when you're young? And, you know, why are you going traveling again? And, you know, even though my parents love to travel, but it was almost like you have to have everything in place first before you sure. can go do that. I was the opposite, <laughs> but um, I just well, I love I had a friend who, who used to call me. She said, like, you just, just do things. And, and, she, and she said, you know, Judith, there's a word for that. It's called being counterphobic. You <laughs> do it and feel the fear later. <laughs> it's so true. It is so true. But I mean, it's these experiences, right? Where you were so off, and you said it as well so clearly that, you know, going to Costa Rica, where all of a sudden, you know, everything that you had identified with had been snapped, like your kids now are even not even living in the same part of the country. Um, So as a mother, what does that mean? Um, You were divorced at this time, too, I imagine? Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, you're on your own, and you're out there, and you're becoming a massage therapist and studying, you know, body work and leaving behind a profession, like a career. I mean, these are all profound things. But at the same time, it's, um, you know, it's all part of the journey. And I think so many people are afraid that it's always going to go wrong, but it never goes wrong. Every time you cut. It's even when it goes wrong, it's right. Exactly. (laughs) Some of the biggest lessons I've learned are things when things have not gone right. And when one has to go and struggle through something. Yes. Struggling is a great teacher. Struggling is a great teacher. And 
you know, what do you think about the way kids are raised nowadays? I just almost feel like they don't have any struggles. And it, and is that a good, or maybe it's just well, a different type of struggle. I think it's a very different type of struggles. You know, I, I'm so grateful that the, the kids, our kids here, had the option of a much sort of freer um, uh, primary school experience. Um, I think that the standard education system right now is struggling, mm -hmm. is struggling. So I think there are huge struggles with, you know, for children. And I also think that they are much more aware than we were of the global issues. Yeah. I mean, it's all over social media. You can't escape it. So um, I think I think the struggles are there. They may be different. Right. Um, yeah. We're so, I mean, we're so blessed here because, you know, our kids grow up in nature. Um, you know, I was in Vancouver a, a couple of weeks ago and, and looking at, you know, from the hotel we were in, we were just surrounded, you know, by high rises. And you'd see little tiny, I'm like looking down, there'd be a, a little tiny playground on the roof of an apartment building. And thinking of all of those families that have been, you know, locked up, you know, mm -hmm. past how much, two, three months. And even just raising a child, I've said, often said to Jaya, can you imagine, you know, growing up in, a, in, in an apartment, uh, you know, where her grandfather lives in, in downtown Toronto, you know, and she loves the city, but, <laughs> but not having that as a child. Yeah. yeah, no, I feel really blessed to have the space that we have, especially during COVID. And we received so many calls for our wellness center, people asking if they can rent it out. And it was exactly that. It was, you know, professional working couples in high rises with their one or two year old, mm -hmm. you know, or two or sometimes even three children in a high rise. And they're like, we have to get out. Yes. And you know, and that was, we're seeing lots of people buying up farmland now. A lot of people are, you know, moving to Courtney and Comox and the island and, you know, buying up, you know, homes that have gardens and backyards. It's, you know, it's, it's quite profound what COVID has done. And the, I think that eye opening that we do need to be able to touch the ground. Yes. I've all that I've always known to be true. Uh, I've had a couple of, um, occasions where I've lived like one, even just one story up and not being able to walk out my front door and it never lasted. I've always had to get out of there and just feel the ground underneath me and trees. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, trees were my, my friends. <laughs> Some, somebody at, uh, I was listening to a podcast last night from Pachamama, which is a community in Costa Rica, which I've spent quite a bit of time at. And they were talking about their, their standing friends, you know, their standing friends who are, are members of that community. Oh, I love that standing friends. I remember taking my first daughter um, hiking. She loved to hike when she was little and she would just, she couldn't wait to get outside. And she would sometimes walk, she was be about one and a half, two years old. And she would walk for an hour in the woods and, but she'd stop and hug every tree and just put her yeah. cheek to the tree. And I just was like, what are you doing? And she would say, it's my friend. And I said, oh my gosh, it just would melt my heart. Um, but yeah, I love that. I have names for trees around, you know, I, some of the work we've done uh, have to do with um, Sikisak Blackfeet teachings. And there's some, there's some beautiful stories that go along and people, uh, and so one tree will be called Wakashni and another would be called, you know, another character in some of those stories. <laughs> and those stories are so beautiful. And, you know, if anybody doesn't know what Judah's talking about, I mean, there's so many Indigenous stories, First Nation stories, um, Aboriginal stories, Inuit, Métis, you know, um, it could be... Um, uh, any, I mean, the Maori stories out of New Zealand, there's so many incredible stories. And if you look at these stories, they all relate to animals and nature. And they're brilliant stories to read to your children because the, 
Um, the mottos in the story are just phenomenal. They're great philosophical teachings. Um, and they just teach us about how to be in relationship with each other and with nature. And so if anybody does not have uh, Indigenous story books on their children's bookshelves, please get them. And, the, and for the child within, those stories are just so, when in the, the circles that we hold in our, our retreats, we often, those stories are often told. And people will come back and they'll say, well, you know, when you told such and such a story, and, and then I remembered it when this was happening in my life. And, you know, the person who gives the teaching, my dear friend, um, uh, We'll just, you know, that's what those stories are meant for because there are, there are universal truths that are contained yeah. in those stories that are just as relevant today as they were then. Exactly. Oh, precious. Yes, yeah, so beautiful. So tell me about what you did when you went and went to Costa Rica for six months and then you came back. Did you go back to doing therapeutic work? I came back and I took a year off. I I um, I had a camper trailer, so that summer I I toured around BC on, you know, with the camper, wow. and landed up over on Salt Spring. I actually was going. I planned on stopping in Nelson, and that's a loop. It was interesting that I I changed. I didn't not do that because I had planned on on, on staying there. And interestingly enough, a lot of my work takes me back into that area now. But um, I landed up on Salt Spring and I stayed there for about a year and, um, uh, and decided during that period of time that I would go back to, do, to doing counseling, that it really was, was my calling. Mm -hmm. And so I moved over um, after one year, I moved over to uh, just briefly to Whistler. And then when Philippe and Sarinda um, began forming their family, we all decided to, to jointly um, buy a piece of land with two houses on it. Uh, and uh, that's where I am now, 20 years later. Wow. And I love your property. It is stunning. Um, I love it. There's so many sections of it that are just beautiful and wild, but then, you know, you have the path that connects your house to Sarinda's house and there's a yoga studio there on the property. And I mean, it is such a beautiful way to live. And it's a way that I've always wanted to live um, probably because it's in my DNA having been born in Africa. And that's how, you know, my grandmother's village and where I was born. I mean, everybody, Every, gen, you know, it's intergenerational and all the cousins and aunts and uncles and aunties and grandmas and grandpas are all together. And um, it really, when I remember raising my kids here, feeling so sad that, you know, so many mothers and fathers were raising their kids in pretty much in isolation, even though you have a whole street full of neighbors, most people don't know their neighbors anymore. And grandparents are living across the other side of the country, aunts and uncles, you see them once or twice a year. And um, yeah, it was just, it to me it was devastating. So I had to create that for myself. So I mothered with my girlfriends and we probably, you know, five out of seven nights, we'd cook dinner together and bathe the kids together and, you know, put them to bed. But, you know, we did live in separate houses, but my dream was to always live in a commune or a kibbutz. Yes. I, I, I looked into that kind of communal living as well at a certain point in time. You know, you asked me, you know, why I had left Ontario to come here, but I realized that, you know, my kids were 22, 20, you know, five, six, they would be having children mm -hmm. and they, and they weren't at that point in time, but I thought I do not want to miss out on that. Yeah. Um, because for two reasons, number one, just for the sheer joy of it and, and to have that kind of family kind of community, but also for an, like a large number of years in their growing up years, I was in not in great shape, you know, <laughs> I was going through my own healing journey and um, um, yeah, I missed out and they missed out on, uh, out on m m me being able to be fully there for them. 
Mm. So uh, I decided, no, nope, I am not missing out on these grandchildren. And I had the privilege of actually almost delivering my first grandchild, Reuben, it was with a water birth. There was obviously, it was a wonderful midwife that was standing right beside me. But uh, yes, and when with Jaya's birth, it was, we were right there, Ruben and I were running across the yard as she was being delivered. <laughs> wow, which is incredible. I love that you um, mentioned that it was a water birth as well. I had water births with my oh. girls. And it was interesting. I mean, my midwife, she's Irish. She's probably delivered close to 11,000 or if not more babies. And, you know, I was able to have these brilliant water births, but it was interesting how so many people were afraid of, Mm -hmm. you know, you can't birth a baby in the water and, you know, the hygiene or that the baby's going to drown or just the, you know, lack of knowledge around that. But it is a beautiful way to bring a child into this world. Is it? It was exquisite. <laughs> wow. And probably very different from how you brought your kids into the world. Hospital births. Yeah. Hospital births. Yes. It's very medical and, yeah. you know, yeah, they would dictate to you how you're supposed to lie down and how you're supposed to. The whole bit. Oh, the stirrups part. My mom always tells me stories about that. And she, after the first time that the doctor did that, she's like, you will never ever treat me like a cow or an animal or and I was like mom like no animals shouldn't even aren't even treated like that you know but women had to have their feet in stirrups stirrups and strapped in it's yeah it was so barbaric so barbaric so then living in Whistler um you now teach retreats is that correct um uh, mm. I for many years I've done private practice and worked with uh, with uh, individuals, with couples, and um, did I've done supervision with other like master students. Um, I've worked with the Mount Curry community here, the First Nations community, mostly with with their frontline workers, mm. which has been was was a great. Um, uh, I was was really you know welcomed into my neighbor's community here in doing that work and um, and the group work as you say the, the our moral is retreats I also let me think was it was the catalyst for all of that part of it was from Pachamama um, after I um, actually it was in Whistler, you, where I first became introduced to the possibilities of working with spirit medicines. Mm. And um, yes, I remember it was in the rotunda of, of the, the, um, community, the community center in, in Whistler. And I picked up a, a cross section of ayahuasca. And for some reason, I had never done any, any kind of mood altering drugs in my life before ever um well alcohol i i would say but even that so i picked up this piece of ayahuasca and just wondered what it was and it just spoke to me and these things don't happen to me and so i uh i did some investigation in it and i was then going back and forth quite regularly to pachamama in costa rica but they were telling me, no, Judita, you can't do it because you're on antihypertensive. Mm. So um, I thought, well, good gosh, if this medicine is what it's supposed to be, it goes where it needs to go. And so I discovered that uh, that Gabor Mate was involved in, in using it as well. So I called Gabor and said, look, please, will you research this for me? Um, I for some reason, when called to do this medicine. And he did, he said, there's no problem. So the first time I did it, I did it in a circle where he was present. I thought, oh, well, if something's going to happen, at least I'll have a doctor in it. Exactly. But, but very soon after, there's other medicines as well. It's called Washuma um, that I became familiar with. And right away, I realized the, the therapeutic healing potential uh, of these spirit medicines and um, began to study more, began to do more ceremonies myself so that I knew 
you know how the you know how the the medicine you know felt in my body i we worked in groups settings so i i knew how it uh, manifested in deep in others what the needs were in order to create safe space to create safety in terms of integration of the work um, and then began began um, my role working with the medicines is largely preparation and integration mm. I don't as a rule pour medicines myself but I do assist in that way and um, we always say, you know, the, the healing is not in the cup. It's not a magic bullet, but it certainly is an amazing opener, an amazing opener and holder so that traumatic memories can be experienced in a less traumatic way. Mm. And with the, I like how you say, and I hear this all the time, is that people are called to this medicine. Yes. And not everybody should, you know, uh, not everybody should take these medicines. And so how do people know? Because it is, you know, especially now you hear about lots of young people and, you know, they're, everybody nowadays is talking about the fact that they're working with a shaman and, um, you know, it's very much, you know, they're posting on social media and it's sometimes hard to know, like, are these people called to it? Are they doing it because it's the, the new cool thing to do? And, you know, what advice do you have for people who are hearing about this? Because for my, same for myself, I mean, I have and um, I'm a researcher, so of course I would do the same thing. Pick up the phone, call Gabor Mate, say, hey, I mean, I've read all his books now, so I know where he stands on this, you know, but I mean, at the time, I'm sure for you, like he hadn't published a lot of his work yet. No. Oh gosh, no. Yeah, so he was still... As a, I, he was there, I, you know, for me as a consultant for, for different situations with uh, clients of mine, mostly with, you know, who were experiencing adult ADHD. You know, that's how I, that was my connection with him. Right. Yeah. And he, and I mean, it's incredible. I know there's a lot of people out there. And if you don't know who Gabor Mate is, please look him up. Um, we'll put a list of the books that he has. He has incredible books for, um, you know, if you have, and I mean, so many people have, but if you do have trauma in your life, stuff that's coming up, surfacing, he talks about how the body says no and how to listen to the body um, and what those signals look like when the body is saying no. That's a really great book as well. Um, but, you know, he has incredible resources out there. But I mean, I just think that is. I love the fact that you said you picked up the phone and called him. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, even for myself, I feel in this past year, and I don't know if it's because the memories have surfaced, but I also feel like now I am being called to plant medicine, but I don't know which one. I don't even know how to go about it. Um, I don't know if it's because now I'm just hyper curious. It's hard to know. So what does that look like for somebody if they are, do feel like they are called to it? I think that it's really important to do deal, do deal. How can I say this? Due diligence, due diligence, yeah. Too many diligence in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, that you check out with people that you trust who have experience. There, you know, there are some, um, I don't work with the nighttime medicine anymore myself, but I do know people who are doing um, uh, ethical work. Um, and I also associate with numbers of people, like there's the Canadian Psychedelic Association, for one thing. There is another organization called MAPS, which is, if I can say it, the Multidisciplinary uh, Association of Psychedelic Studies, MAPS. And uh, there's good information you can get uh, from those associations. There uh, are conferences that are held. Um, I did a, a webinar with one from uh, Alberta recently, which was absolutely brilliant. You know, we had uh, had wonderful conversations because they had 
out, you know, um, chat rooms, and you could talk directly with the presenters. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of information out there. There are good books. Um, I think one of the best things is know somebody, especially mm -hmm. if you're going out of the country. Of because course, there's a lot of people are going out of the country. Oh, well, they were prior to COVID. Yes. They, um, and there are some very uh, good curanderos and curanderos in, um, in Peru, for instance, and there are some that are not. So um, it, it behooves each individual to really check out their destination. Mm -hmm. And they, we talk about, you know, an old Timothy Leary uh, quote, like, depends on set, and which is what you bring to it. Right. and setting so both of those things have to be pretty solid um i myself will do very careful screening for individuals who are coming in um, we do work with trauma but we also want um into to make sure that the individuals who come in have support both before and to integrate later uh, a lot of the work I do is is simply just doing follow up with people. People will just phone and say, you know, if they've been at a retreat or something, they will they will give me a call and we will and we we make ourselves available uh, to do that integration work. It doesn't stop with the ceremony. Right. That's really, really good to hear. I mean, it's, that's the work we do even with my clients when it comes to food as medicine, because it is such a lifestyle change and they are going to have, um, in addition to physical changes in their body as a result of clean eating, what it also does is it liberates the mind. And when the mind is liberated, we see a lot of people start to make big changes in their life because they finally have the energy to, but then that also means massive life shifts. Like a lot of my clients, when they get healthy, they have enough energy. All of a sudden they're like, why am I with my partner? You know, mm -hmm. Because they realized they were only in that relationship, which was not healthy all along, but because they didn't have enough energy to get out of it. Um, or their careers. A lot of people will switch careers after when they get enough energy back in their mental health and the brain fog has lifted. And so we have to support our clients before, during, and after as well. And I think that's the kind of integrated healing that it's not just integrated across the modalities, but also integrated before, during, and after with that individual as well. It's such an important part to the medicine moving forward. Yes, and Lou, we, we work with a lot of trauma and addictions uh, as you're saying, food is one of them. Mm -hmm. And when that is taken away, there's, there's huge with, withdrawal. So yes, that is, a, you know, an absolute uh, important part of a healing journey from, from in working with other people working with their nutrition. Yes. Mm -hmm. Gosh. And so with the, so with the plant medicine that you were doing, you were doing that, um, was that more for the spiritual work and the trauma and um, more psychological or did it also play a role in your physical health as well? Um, I'm just curious because I don't know a lot about it, but. I mean, each person's, um, each person's journey is quite different you know, and their intention of working with the mess and it is, is primary of what, of what uh, will unfold for them during um, a ceremony. Uh, for myself, it really was more spiritual and, and um, emotional. Yeah, I think, and the, you know, the differences I have found was just Again, a growing, you know, that incident I spoke to you about in Costa Rica, in the ocean. That has just continued to, to become richer. Mm -hmm. And the, I think the part that the, the, the medicine has played for me is to have um, a deeper connection with all that is, mm -hmm. with all that is. 
including, you know, um, and to have a more, like a more peaceful connection with myself and with others. Mm. So my, my previous way of being in the world would be more edgy, you know, more, contro- you know, um, judgmental, um, even if on the surface, you know, Judith looked to be very, being very nice. You know, there was, there was that in me that, um, um, and I know that it's, you know, that kind of, it's a protection to sure. be like that. But mu- much of that has eased off. Much of that has eased off. So for me, it was largely the, the emotional and the spiritual. And as I said before, you know, in the ceremonies, we weave in, and I don't do much of the teaching. Uh, my, my friend and colleagues do. Um, we you know, make use of say medicine wheel teachings, indigenous teachings, and mm-hmm. also mystics the present day and more of the, the uh, uh, older mystics of time. And so all of that information is kind of, you know, flows and ebbs and flows within me. And it becomes not so much of what I do with it, it's, it's, it's more of who I am. Mm. It's a beautiful way of putting it. And as you were speaking about it, it's... Um... It made me think of several clients that have, you know, switched their diets, then cleared their minds, their physical bodies became stronger. Then they connected to plant medicines. After that, they're more open to it because they realize that yes, even tomatoes and green lettuces and chard is is medicine. And then they start to see the other medicines that are all around us in the forest, in the mushrooms and the different herbs and spices and, you know, all of it, the, you know, all the roots, all the everything. And then they also start reading, you know, Gabor Mate's work. They understand that there's more work to do. There's the physical, spiritual, mental. And what's been incredible too is, you know, we had, for example, Chris Burke on our podcast and he had some been, he was someone who um, fought in the British Air Force's severe post-traumatic um, stress disorder, um, not just from that, but from lots of other things. And, you know, for him, he was suicidal and, you know, he found plant medicine. But the one thing that he said on our podcast that was so amazing, he said, it was exactly what you described at the beginning with your experience in the ocean and being that little black dot in that ocean in the universe. But he also felt that universal connection as well. And I almost think that the, you know, plant medicines have been used for centuries. And there's just been this 500 year blip in our human history here, Um, colonization and settlers, you know, European settlers coming in and, you know, everything became scientific. We removed nature from science, um, religion from science, spirituality from science. And now it almost feels that, that, the path to returning to truly being indigenous, which is where, um, you know, it means to be born from the land, but also to be thinking about seven generations ahead and wanting to protect the land for the next seven generations, um, that it's almost a path to that again. I think so too. I, um, uh, the, um, uh, yeah, sorry. I'm blanking here. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. But it's, you know, for me, I just went off on a journey. <laughs> I love it. But it's, but even when you were talking too, I went into that journey of thinking, oh my gosh, really seeing how it is um, a path forward where we connect to that because all of our pharmaceutical medicines are derived from plant medicines. Mm-hmm right? Whether it comes from an apple or whether it comes from an ayahuasca plant or whether it comes, I mean, but then it gets synthesized because they want to standardize it and they want to be able to put it in a pill and charge for Mm -hmm. it and also make sure it's safe for people. I get that too. But I mean, but they talk about synthetic drugs as it being like the miraculous wonder created in the scientific community when it was really created originally in nature, right? the, this, the spirit medicines have just, they're, 
that they're such beautiful old traditions and their whole their whole action is to connect to the greater wonder of, of and oneness of all that is Exactly, exactly. And so your journey then, you know, up in, and recently your, this big shift that happened for you was um, this greater connection to food as medicine as well, because let's talk about that, because here you are, you are obviously mentally, um, you know, and spiritually and emotionally, now you've done all of this work and then, but physically your health wasn't doing so well. So let's talk about that. What did, what did your health look like prior to you making these lifestyle shifts? Well, over the years from about my mid forties, when I began um, taking the antihypertensive, there was a concurrent slow, slow, you know, weight gain. And what I long believed to be true, but could not find any validation for, was that it was all connected. Mm -hmm. And I would go into, you know, first of all, it was my blood pressure. The next thing that happened was uh, my thyroid uh, was low and no function. I felt like I was swimming through molasses for a mm. long time. Um, and um, that was, I, at that point I went to a naturopath and, and she was able, because when taking the thyroid medication, I still was not getting any relief from my tiredness and my fatigue and my dullness. Mm -hmm. And so that helped with, you know, sort of replacing some of the things that I, I needed but it still was a medical model in many ways, yes. even yeah. though it's from a naturopath. And I, I'm forever grateful to her because it did relieve symptoms. But then as time went on, the next thing that happened, my blood sugars were going crazy and high. So that added not only the, the um, medication for my thyroid, but now we have a pre-diabetic uh, situation mm -hmm. so i became i was on metformin and it started off with 500 milligrams three times a day and then it became up to um 850 milligrams a day which is a fairly high dose for pre-diabetic yeah and and i still was feeling um a sort of a continued well i used to call it wallpaper anxiety and depression was never depressed. People would walk in the door and, oh, yes, how are you doing? You know, you know, chipper and happy. Um, but it was always there. It was just mm -hmm. sort of hanging there. And my energy levels were, were you know, I, I mean, I just hated sort of getting out. I would almost stand behind myself and push myself out the door to do exercise and to do yeah. walks. And... Um, um, the, uh, and also my, my memory, you know, I was finding that just in the little things, you know, the kind of, you know, people just laugh it off and just say, oh yes, you know, yeah, I walk from room to room and I can't remember what I'm looking for. But I was noticing that more and more little things were not sticking for me. Mm -hmm. And so this went on and I mean, I would ask questions you know, things like, like my C-reactive protein, which is an indicator of inflammation in the system. I would ask questions. I'd say, well, you know, what, what is causing this? You know, oh, Judith, it's just nonspecific. Yeah, idiopathic, they say. <laughs> nonspecific. And, you know, it, uh, and I would complain about, you know, things like, say, I, you know, I can remember one time, saying, I think, I think I've got adrenal fatigue. And one of the doctors pointing up to Mount Curry and laughing and saying, ah, people climb up there and, and ski down there all the time. and They don't have adrenal fatigue. Oh, I had and one doctor say to me, what are your adrenals? And I said, pardon me? And they said, yeah, what's adrenal fatigue? And I said, well, when your adrenals 
get tired and they are overworked and super depleted. And, and she literally did not know about the adrenals. Like, it's like she forgot about, and maybe she had not been particularly taught that in med school, that they're little tiny organs that live on your kidneys and they are real. And they, and they may not show up. You might not have either of the two extremes, either low with, you know, Cushing's and, and I've forgotten the other one, but there, that's what shows up if they test your adrenals. They don't, they do not and cannot test that, that intermediate stage where you're just feeling low. So that whole, what I call the HPA axis, which is your hypothalamus, your um, pituitary in your adrenal glands, that gets all thrown out of whack. Exactly. And add to that all the side effects for all of those pharmaceuticals, which can be low, you know, magnesium, they create fatigue, weight gain. Um, what else? You know, there are just numerous. Oh, yes. And they create things like acid reflux. Mm-hmm. So then you add another pharmaceutical called rambaprazole, one of those, what they call them, um, uh, uh, um, not protein block. Anyway, it, it's neither here nor there. But, you know, so, so you add on another one. Another symptom for me was extreme leg cramps. I would get just mm. powerful, you know, painful uh, leg cramps in the, in the middle of the night. And so another pharmaceutical, I was taking quinine. Mm. So can you imagine? I've got, you know, metformin. I've got rem ripple for my blood pressure i've got quinine i've got thyroid medication there's another one in there too remiprazole for the you know the uh, the acid reflux yeah and then also when your thyroid and hypothalamus and adrenal glands are all out of whack as well you get muscle pain and joint pain and then things like arthritis starts to set in and then you can't you don't want to exercise that's right so talking about the arthritis that was actually you know the catalyst for me making the change mm. i had over um, on two occasions, one in my left knee and one in my right, a popliteal cyst, which are, is known as Baker's cyst, which is a fluid swelling in that yeah. joint. Um, and there are arthritic changes in, in my knees. So I knew, I knew what to do the second time around. But, um, and I did, went to physio and, 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 and did what I could. But I was also scheduled to do a retreat and I had had uh, a cortisone shot before, for the first time I had it. So I called up my sports medicine doctor, and thank goodness she was back in Whistler. And I went to her, and um, uh, she, yes, you know, she, she did the the cortisone shot, which I would I was only doing because I. Had, a, had the retreat coming up and I wanted to be mobile for that. But what she said to me very bluntly was, my knee would benefit greatly if I lost weight. Read this book. What was the book? <laughs> the book was Jason Fung's book called The Obesity Code. Okay. And within the first few pages of that book, I saw, suddenly had the key, the missing key, because, you know, uh, Nikki, I, I eat healthily. I eat mm-hmm. organically. Um, I eat, you know, a, a, a good, you know, I don't, I'm not drawn to doing, you know, treats and sugars and white flour, none of that. But I was eating often. I would have a healthy Mm. breakfast and then I would have a snack, maybe just a couple of mandarins, maybe, you know, a handful of nuts or something on lunch and more grazing in the afternoon. And maybe, you know, like a cup of, you know, you know, warm milk or something before bed. So I was eating often. Mm -hmm. So the key was discovering about insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance. 
and I, you know, I now like, when I think, well, if I was hard on myself, God, you should have known this. But you know, I've asked the questions and sort of gotten mm -hmm. all of these runarounds and just more reactive uh, pharmaceuticals that were just, just written out and handed to me. And if you can't find somebody to give you these answers, for example, like this intermittent fasting or, you know, to stop grazing. And for some people, they do do better on six meals a day and other people don't do well at all on six meals a day. For a vast majority of people, you know, three meals or even two meals or even one meal a day is actually better for them. And it really depends what your diet is. Because if you are a big meat eater as well, then definitely eating three times a day if meat's going to be in there is not a good idea because it does, it stiffens your endothelial cells. And then the insulin can't cross over the vascular walls to bring the glucose into the cells where it can be utilized. So so it really also depends on what your diet is, but it's what I love about, you know, the story you just told Judith is that you didn't give up, you know, that a lot of people would just resign and be like, well, I'm, I'm just getting older. And a lot of doctors do tell their patients, well, this is old age, deal with it. Oh, and here's another drug. Yes. They've even told me sometimes it's good to have an elevated blood sugar. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I know. Yes, I've heard that one. I've heard that one too. You know, it, um, um, I, I'm, I'm, I am bewildered at, at the lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. you know? And let me tell you, if I had a heart attack or a stroke, I would depend on these guys or my, you know, I had a car. Totally. I would depend on their expertise in those areas. But you know, when I, even at, at looking at me when I had lost substantial amount of weight and all my lab results are now normal. All Amazing. Of them, all of them. I am no longer on metformin. I'm no longer on, on remeprazole or quinine. And I am on half dose of my blood pressure medication and a half dose of my thyroid medication. And I'm thinking just because even that I think will go lower in the next little while because I'm finding my blood pressure is a little too low. Right. So, if, um, and the reaction to just one, not my particular physician, but I, you know, one of them as I met in there said, well, Judith, not everybody's as disciplined as you are. And I just said, well, how about that we at least give them the information? Yeah. We because like that, yeah, they just need that information. And if it's coming from somebody in a white lab coat, I guarantee it's going to be received. And the, pro the person will probably be disciplined. If the doctor says, hey, this can potentially, they don't even have to say it will. They can just say, I know a, a patient, Judith. Yes. She did this and it worked for her. Why don't you try it? At the end of the day, it's not like you're taking, you know, crazy drugs that you're experimenting with. You're no. using food and you are using time, like whether for it's, you know, intermittent fasting or spacing out your meals. It's not something that's going to harm you. So why not give the patient that option? But, exactly. and you said it as well. I mean, I would, I'm not a therapist, so I wouldn't try to be a therapist or I wouldn't try and tell somebody that therapy doesn't work for them because I am not a therapist. Whereas I find though in the medical system, a lot of people try to be nutritionists by telling doctors or their patients that nutrition has nothing to do with it. It is, it is beyond, it, I mean, for me, it is it won't be at this, in this day and age, it's beyond comprehension. I feel mm -hmm without being too judgmental, the practicing 19th century medicine in the 21st century. Exactly. The, it, it has to change because uh, the other, you know, the, the other thing that I think also is important is all the contaminants that are in our food. Mm -hmm. now, um, and all of those, you know, the, the glyphosate, you know, the, 
the GMOs. You know, you know, going back to my my my, my dear daughter, uh, one of the things that she said to me back when we were, uh, when I was still living in the bush on a lake in Ontario, when she would get my a friend of mine would call her the the you know the the kitchen police. She would, you know pull things out of the cupboard and she would say, "Can you pronounce that?" If you can't pronounce that, why would you put it in your mouth? Exactly. <laughs> you know, and into the garbage, you know. <laughs> so, But we have to be that way for our friends, though, because a lot of people just do not know. They think that if the bag or the box that they're buying says natural or healthy or organic or whatever it is, then they think it's okay. But what they don't realize is that even your organic healthy product, you know, that has turmeric in it, or that is fortified with all these vitamins, it's all made out of synthetic, refined sugar, salt, flowers, all of that stuff. And so we need people to be the kitchen police, like that it needs to be the next profession. I think that was my, that was, you know, that has stayed with me. So, you know, and that was shortly before I left Ontario. And, uh, and I have to say, you know, being in in this environment here especially but it, over on salt spring even in you know the, our access to a good organic mm -hmm. vegetables and fruits and you know a friend who lives in the community and so and sometimes i'm gifted with you know beautiful salmon you know from our local river so we are very lucky wow. so yes you know and my what I'm eating now has not changed substantially because I had, I was eating, you know, nutritious, organic um, food. I basically eat um, uh, vegetarian, but I do eat fish and I, and, um, and I do eat a, um, eggs and, and, and yogurt. Um, but other than that, it's pretty, you know, it's straight vegetarian. Yeah, you do eat a lot of vegetables too. I mean, I saw you at the market and you were, you know, shopping for all of the greens and all the beautiful different, you know, rainbow foods that are out there. Well, yeah, my my lunch will be like like a rainbow. I look at the pot and it's, you know, it's it's white or um orange, yellow, green. <laughs> Which is a brilliant which is a brilliant way of doing it because then that way for, you know, my kids and I, we happened to stay in a hotel recently and uh, they had cable in which we don't have cable. So we, there's a lot of stuff we just don't ever get to see, but they had a show called the 600 pound, my 600 pound life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it shows the weight loss journey of people who are, you know, morbidly obese, but it was so sad to watch this because you know, it shows their interaction with their doctors who are going to do their lap band surgery or, you know, their all the different, you know, surgeries to help them lose weight. But then they say, well, you just got to go eat less. Like you got to go eat, you know, 1200 that, calories. Yes, And that is the biggest fallacy, like calories in calories out Yeah, is a fallacy that, I mean, I have done the calories, you know, lowered uh, my intake and faithfully gone to the gym and stayed static exactly it is for me the key was knowing about insulin sensitivity yeah knowing to cut out all of the snacks um i mean for i lost doing two meals a day i came down 30 pounds wow. and did not feel deprived no, exactly. And the thing is too, is that you, when you eat an, an abundance of fruits and vegetables and legumes and whole grains, I mean, it's hard to get a lot of calories, but you can still have a plate that's heaping full of food. Oh. So if you eat two meals a day, I mean, you're going to be full and your body has a lot to work with. And versus if you eat a ton of refined flour and refined sugar products and, you know, all of these things that um, are high calorie, but in actual small quantities, well, you never get that feeling of being satiated because your stomach is never full. So you're always looking for food, but not even because you're looking for big quantities of food. It's actually because you're looking for nutrients versus... Yeah. The vegetables, the fruits, the grains, the legumes have, are chocked full of an abundance of different, the diversity of nutrients that you need. 
Yes, and along with the herbs, and cooking with as well. The other, the other aspect was uh, in doing so. I also um, practice bringing mindfulness hmm. to that whole process. Um, and so, what does that look like? Because people talk about mindful eating yeah. or mindful it, cooking, but what does that look like then in your life? Really means instead of just reacting from a feeling you respond it's what that means for me is okay when i go to you know the, open the refrigerator what is this about is this because i'm truly hungry or have i just had a really intense session with somebody yeah or, you need comfort I, or yes so what is real hunger and what is emotional eating? And am I, or am I, it, it might not just be increased, you know, tension from something that's mildly disturbing or disturbing. It could be just sheer boredom. Yeah. Just sheer boredom. And so it's being aware of what is in the moment. You know, the, the standard, you know, teachings are, are, you know, the body scan, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, you know, you, know, that one, you know, that simple little exercise where you put a raisin, one raisin in your mouth and you taste it, you know, instead of how grabbing, you know, a whole handful and putting it in your mouth. So being aware of all those taste sensations. In, the next stage is doing like a walking meditation, being aware. I often say to clients when they're here, now, part of your, your, of you gaining tools is when you leave here, that you go out and you are aware of every, how your foot is touching the ground. Mm. And then these are ways of training the body to be with what is in the moment. And when you, and, and then that just transfers over into so many aspects of our lives. You know, it, it, it transfers into road rage, you know, it transfers totally. into, you know, what happens when somebody, you know, posts something on Facebook and you're like, ah, you know, <laughs> and there's absolutely nothing wrong with having those big emotions, um, but just don't build a house there. Yeah. Exactly. You know, <laughs> you, you can be aware of, you know, the anger coming into your body and you can feel it. And unless you're, you know, in the middle of, you know, the supermarket, you don't have to discharge it then, but you can, you can hold it in a way and, and, and bring compassion to it. I love that. I so, love that. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that I love that in the sense that um, I know for sure I've built many houses in that place, many, mm -hmm. many houses that have barricaded me from being able to move forward. Yes. Um, and then you have to tear down that house and that takes work too. And, mm -hmm. you know, surrounded by a whole new set of emotions because you almost feel a slight shame for having let yourself go there. But you know, what Judith is talking about here, what you're talking about is so, so important because we are in a society where we're moving at lightning speed and we're doing it on our own in a lot of cases, not in an intentional community that you've built with, you know, yourself, your children and grandchildren, you know, and it's, it is time. Like we, we need to bring mindfulness, not just to our eating, but we need to bring it to every day in our life and to our communication as well. And the words that we're using. Yes. As well. That's what you made me think about when you were talking about and there this. Are, there are, you know, little things, you know, I, I, I run through, um, is it true? Yes. Is it necessary? Is it kind? You know, yes. there's a little thing in my toolbox. And the other one is uh, those, those words also apply to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so bringing um, loving kindness, you know, to ourselves instead of shaming ourselves or shooting ourselves is another aspect of our relationship not uh, with food yeah you no know, and with with all of our our interactions and that starts with our interaction with ourselves exactly that loving kindness is so is so important that is one of the things uh, um, many years ago now um, 
I was a participant in a ceremony. And I had done this particular medicine once before. It's, it's a cactus. It's, it's, a, it's a cousin to peyote. It's, it's called Wishuma. It's lower mescaline in it. Um, and um, the first time I had experienced it, I thought, wow, this is just awesome, you know, medicine, because I'd done some, some darker trips on, on the nighttime medicine. And um, so the second time I was, you know, really up for it, and I was just delighted to be doing it, looking forward to another really uh, fun and wonderful experience. And it started out beautifully. I was, um, uh, I'd become a tree. Mm. And... I looked and the bark, I could feel it, was really thick and strong. And I looked up at the foliage and it was, it was, it was abundant. It was just a beautiful canopy. And then the root system it was extensive and strong and supportive of this tree. And then I started going into the core mm. of the tree and I encountered an iron band. And I was, that's the heart of the tree. And what I realized in that moment was that I was being resistant to taking in love. I can mm. care for the world. You know, my clients, my children, my family. Um, but there was still this restriction around me being able to be open to taking in love. And in that moment, I was so pissed off. It wasn't even me. <laughs> I'm thinking, holy, I have done 30 odd years of therapy and emotional healing, and here I'm still blocked. And um, uh, the person who was facilitating, who become my beloved friend and colleague, uh, Duncan Brady, uh, came and sat very quietly at the bottom of my mat, and he motioned to me, to put my hand on my heart, mm -hmm. in my belly, and to breathe into it. And it was just an amazing experience that bringing that compassion and that loving kindness to that wounded part of myself. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that uh, so many people who are listening to this can relate to because, you know, especially, you know, now we're in the midst of COVID still, but there's such a movement now to give even more, right? To, you mm -hmm. know, support people and help people and which is beautiful. But I think that, and especially for a lot of women as well, is that, I think it's almost an epidemic in itself of how much women can give, but not give to themselves. Yes. How yes. compassionate they can be, but not be self-compassionate. Exactly. And I know that's something that comes up for me. Oh, it doesn't matter how much work I do. It doesn't matter how many different practitioners I see, whether mm -hmm. it's a yoga instructor, a natural path, a body worker, a psychic, a therapist, it, always comes back to that. And sometimes I even pull a card and the card, it's always the same card that says, compassion. yeah, compassion for the self, put your arms around yourself and just say, I love you. I love you. And the very first time I did that, it took me 45 minutes before I could even say that. Yes, My body well, physically would not allow me to show love for myself, but in a drop of a hat, I will run into a burning building and save a stranger's dog. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think you definitely hit the nail on the head there that, you know, for everybody who's listening, I mean, right now, just put your hand on your heart and your other hand on your belly and just breathe in love for yourself right now. Because when we do that, that is the very first step in healing this world and healing our community and healing our families. Yes. And look for the words that mean something for yourself. You know, for me right now, I mean, it changes, but uh, for me, I, I will sit and, and in, I, I'm, 
I'm not a very good sitting meditation person, but I do do it like throughout the day, little bits. Um, is to I breathe in love and breathe out peace. Mm. And in the space, I'll say peace and love, peace and love. And so bring in love. Breathe out. Such a good grounding activity that I'm going to leave our audience with. There is, there's so much more I want to um, go into with you. So we're going to have to do another show. I wanted to talk to you about being married to one of the first uh, black judges. Um, yes. I think that's a really important story in itself because, you know, I wanted to talk to you about what it, and maybe we can touch on that a little bit, um, what it was like to raise children who are mixed race as well, especially right now in the light of, you know, everything that is, that George Floyd's uh, murder and death has, has brought. And we did touch on that in the, um, in the parking lot at the farmer's market there as well, you had asked such a beautiful question at one point to your daughter, which I'd soon just said she couldn't remember you really asking that to her. But, you know, I think it was just a beautiful question. You know, what is it like growing up as a woman of color mm -hmm. as well, which I thought was so interesting, you know, coming from you being a, you know, white Caucasian mother with children who have dark skin um, and just such a beautiful question to ask because I was never asked that ever, you know, and even with all of this happening, most of my friends, you know, Surint and I laughed about it. Most of our friends just think we're white with dark skin. So for them, they didn't ask us what our viewpoint was. And, you know, there's a lot of stories there, but um, can you touch on that a little bit because on um, what that was like being married to, um, you know, a, a Jamaican dark-skinned man because for my parents when they got married my dad is Caucasian and my mom is African and Indian and he lost a lot of his friends when they got married and what was that like for you especially and maybe different because it was Toronto where there is a much bigger um, Caribbean uh, population and African-American pop or African Canadian Canadian population whereas in British Columbia where I grew up it was definitely not like that um, initially, I think within my family, there was great resistance, um, especially for my mother. Um, she had uh, very vehement um, uh, reaction to my getting married to Keith. But we were, we were really largely... Um, really protected because of his position, because of his uh, friendships um, from really from any, any harsh um, racist backlashes. And our friends tended to be multiracial. Mm. Our French, you know, were, were Caucasians, uh, were Italians, were Sri Lankans, um, were Jamaicans, were um, uh, um, a multitude of, of, uh, of races. So, and you're right. And I had, uh, you know, I'd lived in downtown Toronto. I'd lived near the Jewish market, the Kensington market. And so it was a polyglot of, of right. different nationalities. Um, so I really and truly, um, except for the resistance of my mother, um, uh, there was, we didn't really find a backlash or a backlash. Um, and, you know, and the kids are mixed, very mixed. So, you know, Surinder was looked at really as rather beautiful and exotic looking. Mm -hmm. And my son had darker skin, but more Caucasian features. So he could have been, you know, um, Southern Italian or, or Eastern European or any, any different race. Um, yeah. It, uh, 
Yeah, same. I think, so, Toronto, I think Toronto helped. I think so too. Definitely. It sounds, you know, quite different than the way it was for me here, even growing up that, um, you know, knowing my parents' stories, I had the same, very similar thing. My grandmother um, really despised my mother. So we experienced it that way. Um, and as she got older and she had a stroke and that stroke enabled her to speak her truth, actually. Um, and, you know, she was able to say a lot of things to my mom that had probably been, she'd been holding in for, you know, you know, decades and which was interesting because she had grown up in East Vancouver, which was also very multicultural. You know, we had the Polish community, Japanese, Chinese, she had a lot of Italian, Chinese um, and Chinese friends um, and, you know, but not a lot of black people in mm -hmm. our community. And it was interesting to have grown up with, um, grown up like that. And it is hard when it is a family member that doesn't see that but it's been interesting though too because even i realized my mom was almost i would say slightly racist towards black people um when i was growing up in a predominantly white culture where she was like nikki you cannot date black men and i don't know if it was from her probably wanting to protect me Mm -hmm. um, from what she had to go through, you know, and, but I mean, she would never say that now she can't even remember ever saying that, but I'm sure it was really just out of fear, out of, you know, you know, wanting to protect the children from any further racism. And, you know, I often, you know, my girls are, they look quite white with maybe olive skin. Um, you know, so they are going to have a very different experience, um, growing up. And I mean, times have changed dramatically too. And I mean, and George Floyd's murder and death has brought up, you know, the, you know, the thousands of stories of racism. Um, and I think made it also very evident that a lot of times in Canada, we think like, oh, there's not racism here because we're so multicultural, but there is profound racism. You know. Profound racism. I grew up in a small town in Northern Ontario and I knew the Polish um, kids, Finnish, Italian, French Canadians, um, uh, who was who was of Jewish faith. I mean, we, we knew all of that. However, there was no there's no one of color except a very fine and wonderful man who was my 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 um, my singing teacher, um, and we saw no First Nations mm. people. Not at, in the grocery store, not at my church, not in my school. And in later years, I looked at, at the number of reserves that were around Timmins. There are many. Yes. You know, so, and I also remember being at a youth group as a teenager and being shown a film, you know, uh, of the racist, you know, attitudes in the United States. Mm. And never, and this, of course, was at a time when residential schools were across this country. Yeah. I know. And it's, and I see that all the time here in Canada too, that, you know, there's such a lack of history and knowledge and awareness of even what residential schools are, what colonium, colonialism is, um, what it means to be, you know, a settler in a post-settler community, what it means to be indigenous in a post-settler community and, um, or in a settler community. And, you know, those, that's, those are just words that most people don't even know. They have no context of what that means. And that's something that uh, when we look at our education system, I mean, I really hope that that changes um, starting now because that, you know, that embedded trauma, it doesn't just affect Indigenous people, it affects us as well when we, you know, are not aware of it because then it affects how we interact with everybody around us. And when you talk about, you know, the fact that there were not indigenous folks in the grocery store and around, like that is segregation at its that max. Is segregation, exactly. Yeah. You know, and even like the names of the rivers and, you know, places around are all indigenous names, but we knew nothing of the indigenous community that was there. Exactly. 
Exactly. Yeah. And that absolutely needs to change too, because if we're living in Canada and think there's no racism, it's profound and it's all around us. And um, it is definitely something that we need to uh, talk about more. Yeah, and I see it. I mean, in this, I mean, I've lived in this community now for 20 years and I can throw a stone over onto the reserve. Mm -hmm. so originally, this is originally indigenous land that I am living on. And I'm very much well aware of that. I also see um, signs that um, there, there are changes happening. Our, like our local, um, you know, mayor and council has, it has a lot of um, uh, connection with the, 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 um, the Mount Curry community. The, there is a First Nations school on the on and has been there for uh, a friend was telling me this 35 years and where they teach the Kumush language and they've recently built and opened a postgraduate um, college just around the corner for us which is open to both uh, both communities and wow. I am sensing um, more light in the eyes of the young people of this community than I used to see Mm, that is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. More light. Yeah. But we definitely need much, much, there's so much more work that needs to be done and healing that needs to be done. And, um, and I think everything that we talked about today, you know, the connection to food and more traditional foods, like the real foods, the unrefined foods, um, that's going to be part of it. Um, for both, you know, on reserve members and off reserve members, because then once we can, you know, eat these foods, be nutrified, clear our heads, get connected to the land, be more open to all of the spirit medicines as well, both on reserve, off reserve, that we get that connection to the land as well and the need to protect the land. And then I think that there's also going to be much more um, understanding that traditional ways of knowing all of that traditional knowledge that we have been ignoring and shutting down and repressing that there'll be more openness to wanting to learn about that and to understand that those were ways and are ways that are some of the most sustainable ways, the only ways of living really um, and bringing that back. And then it'll hopefully I see a meeting and a new definition of, of humanity because this, current definition of humanity needs to really be tethered and, and severed and, and, and come to an end. But yes, it definitely does the, you know, working to, to, to see this land as a source merely of extraction, what we can take from it um, is, it's a crime. It truly mm -hmm. is a crime. And, um, the indi the indigenous teachings have it so much, you know, to teach us. Uh, I remember, you know, when I was working up in Nkwakwa, another First Nations community, which is close to here, and the elders telling me about forest management and how they never had these raging forest fires. Mm -hmm. They knew how to go in and cull certain trees and to do um, strategic burnings. So they didn't have the massive exactly. fires that we're having today. Exactly. Um, and those teachings as well, I mean, we have so much learning to do. And I mean, universities across the planet, um, you know, need to incorporate indigenous ways of knowing and teachings into all the curriculum within the science sciences, you know, how do we ethically do science, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, because science has been part of indigenous communities all around the world for centuries, like going back to the Egyptians and the Polynesians and, and so on. And so we can still do science as we know it today, but in an ethical way. And an ethical way, because right now the majority of science is industry funded exactly exactly and yeah it'll be interesting to see what happens and you had said something earlier as well that i think is quite profound and it's really important to leave people leave our audience with is that you know as 
George Floyd's murder and death has, um, has brought up so, so, so much in all these communities um, around the world, even not just North America, but what's so important and what you said is that you were invited into Indigenous communities. Uh, it's so important to know that as a non-Indigenous member, you can't then just start charging into communities because that's been done, right? Yeah. You have to be invited and welcomed and brought in almost like the plant medicine welcomes you and brings you in as well. But it's so important that you can't just take your post-colonial ways of thinking even about education and say, well, we need to now go and take the teaching and put it into the universities. And it doesn't work like that. It needs to be co-created. It needs to be an invitation. It needs to be a walking together um, that needs to happen. And so this is going to be interesting to see how that unfolds as well in the coming um, years. Very important. You know, um, I couldn't go in as quotes, you know, the healer mm -mm. In, into, into this community at all. Um, I, could, I, I went in as a listener. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. A listener. That is a very powerful word. Um, you know, and again, it's like that circles back to what you said. And, you know, where we'll end this podcast today, though, is by putting your hand on your heart, by putting your hand on your belly, taking that deep breath and listening to what is within. Yes. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Judith, for being on our Eat Real to Heal show and sharing all of your wisdom uh, with us, with our audience. I am deeply moved by uh, the courage that you have to try new things, to learn new things, to pick up and move, to um, and on that infinite. Uh, thirst for knowledge that you have. So I hope that that has, you know, quenched some of our listeners' thirst out there because you've provided, provided so much information. Um, and for everybody who's listening, I mean, you don't need to do it all at once that know that Judith is in her 70s. And so this is a journey. I'm 45 years old right now. And, you know, as I hear everything that you've shared, sometimes I want to rush into it and I want to know it now, experience it now, feel it now, live it now, but it doesn't work that way. It is stepping stones. It is experiences one after another. Um, but definitely pick up anything that Judith put down today for you and uh, start to implement even whether it's a walking meditation or just this breathing into your heart and into your belly, choose one thing and start to do it today. Thank you, Judith, for being here. Thank you, Nicola. It's always a pleasure. Amazing. Welcome back and tell me, how did you enjoy that episode with Judith? Isn't she magnificent in all areas. She is a wealth of wisdom and knowledge and you know she's been able to do it and so can you. She successfully reversed her disease. She switched career paths. She's helping people and she is of service. You can do all of those things as well. And folks, you know what to do when you listen to these shows. If at any point there was a message that resonated with you or that triggered a thought of somebody else in your life, then send this podcast to them because the teachings from Judith can help them. And it is our job, it is our duty to share stories and to share knowledge with others. That's how we have evolved here as human species where we are today. It's through sharing of knowledge and stories, stories that keep us safe, that keep us alive, that help us thrive, that help us be aware of the enemy or any triggers or traumas that could be looming around the corner. You know, all of this information, it is there to be shared with others. So don't hesitate to forward this episode or any other episode that you have listened to on the Eat Real to Heal show. And also would love to hear from you. How can we improve this show for you? We want to know, so please write to us. And before I sign off, I just want to share a few things that we've been doing over the last two weeks. So we have done tons of video editing and filming. We have done two incredible 
uh, photography shoots with the famous Anastasia Chomlak, an incredible photographer who does these sessions called All of You, particularly working with women, but not exclusive to women, where she really captures women in their element. And that's what Anastasia did for us. So check out our two new websites, richerhealthretreatcenter.com and richerhealth.ca, where we have officially launched our 22 million campaign for those of you who don't know what that is, that is where I will be cycling and biking 7,120 kilometers across Canada from the West Coast to the East Coast to be able to spread the message that food is medicine and that our medicine is our food. This is also part of our my PhD research where I'm going to be meeting with communities that I stop in, meeting with physicians, youth, and Indigenous members to really help youth physicians and Indigenous members remember that food has always been and will always be our medicine. I also want to uncover what are the barriers to health and the barriers to implementing food as medicine into their lifestyle, into their day-to-day -day routines. And we want to know what those barriers are so that we can work to overcome those barriers. So this is just another um, iteration of what we do at The Green Mustache and at Richer Health. And I hope you'll follow our journey. So head over to our website, sign up to learn about my training regime, my nutrition, as I'll be doing the entire journey on a plant-based whole food, unrefined food, diet and I want you to be able to see how I do that and learn from it so that you can do it yourself. So thanks everyone for being here with us. It has been such a pleasure. See you soon next week on the next episode of the Eat Real to Heal podcast. Bye for now.